Well, hi, and it is fantastic to welcome to the Godcast uh, today, uh, Giles Fraser. Now, Giles is quite a high-profile Anglican priest. He is a journalist. He is a broadcaster. He's currently the priest in charge at St. Mary's in Newington, which is near the Elephant and Castle in South London. He also used to write for The Guardian, as well as appearing frequently on BBC Radio 4, and he is a regular contributor to Thought for the Day. So, Giles, hello and welcome. Hi, mate. Very nice to see you. Thank you for inviting me. Have you had a good day? Uh, I, well, it's been... So, that for, for many of us with lockdown, with kids, because I've got lots of kids, and um, my wife works, so we share childcare. So today's been a day of childcare, which has been a lot of fun. So I've been with two of my little ones, and we've been to the market. And um, I did mass this evening, but I haven't done anything terribly holy, I have to tell you, apart from looking after my kids, which is, I suppose that is quite holy, really. But that's, that's what I've been doing today. So yeah, good day. Yeah, has, has it been all right getting back to church? Giles, how's, how's it gone for you down there? Um, well, yeah, we, um, it, it's obviously terrible having to do all this stuff on Zoom and try, you know that was that was just a utterly miserable period. Um, but we, yeah, we're getting we're, we're getting quite a few people actually. Um, uh, we we have probably about as many people now on Zoom as we have in church. We probably have about 50, 50 numbers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's not bad. It's not. It's not bad. It's not. We haven't been decimated, though. Though we're slightly. We're in an area where it, it's. Um, my church has traditionally been a black majority church, and I was thinking over the last few years that we might, um, because of gentrification, we might be tipping over into sort of like something very coming towards a sort of more. The black majority was losing out, but actually. COVID has seen white flight in areas like this. So middle-class flight to the countryside. Okay. So um, that's one of the things that's happened, I think, quite right. seems to be happening here in, in, yeah. in church. Oh, that's interesting. Charles, I just want to um, just um, go back, uh, talk about yourself for a little bit. Just, um, you've been a, a Christian most of your adult life, I take it. Um, yeah. I'm just kind of wondering when and what point in your life you actually felt this kind of vocational call to the priest and when did that kind of happen for you oh funnily enough that i say my story is like not one i'd recommend anybody else to 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 emulate but i actually decided that i was would call myself a christian almost exactly the same moment as i decided i wanted to be a priest they were they were they were almost exactly the same thing it was a very bookish journey i mean i was an atheist at university and then i started reading um, well, funnily enough, I started reading really quite anti-religious uh, philosophers who started to pose the question of God in a way that I sat up and took notice of. Before, I was sort of quite indifferent to it, really. Um, and I started reading people like Nietzsche, who, uh, who loathed religion. And uh, I couldn't quite work out why he loathed it so much and what the, where the passion came from. And so I spent quite a long time with these people, and I suppose, in a sort of strange way, I sort of worked out what the, where the passion came from, and it may well be in a very odd way that I picked up the passion from the people who hate it most. And um, along the way, I, I mean, for years I started to be, as one of those people that people would say, um, you know, Giles, he's got this really weird, like, hobby almost, which is that... He's like really into religion, but I, I wouldn't really go to church and I really wouldn't describe myself as a Christian. But then something gave way inside me and it was, very, well, um, we were having, funnily enough, I mean, one of the decisive moments, we were having a posh dinner party with a load of friends right. and, uh, and uh, we had that game, which what would you do if you weren't doing what you're doing now? You know, just like, yeah, yeah. and the person next to me wanted to be a racing car driver and, there was a rather chubby lass that wanted to be a ballet dancer right. and, we all, and everybody had a laugh at all of this and we were slightly taking the piss out of ourselves and I said I wanted to be a priest and everybody laughed in the same way they laughed at the other people and when we were washing up afterwards I realised that I was the only person around the table who could do what they said that they were going to do really yeah. and it, it just, you know, then it just wouldn't leave me alone and um, yeah, it was in a library, I decided that's it, this is, I've, got to, I've got to cross the line and be 
inside looking out rather than outside looking in. Yeah, so, I'll come. I'll come back to that atheist stuff in a, in a few minutes, if I may. But you, um, you're not uh, you're not unbeknown to the northwest, are you? Because you you studied up uh, well, in the northeast. You studied at Newcastle. Yeah. But what about Lancaster? My, my brother went to Lancaster, and and I studied at Cumbria. Um, uh, what's your recollections of uh, Lancaster? Was it a good time? Well, I have to tell you that unfortunately, I don't have much connection with the Northwest because even though I did do my PhD at Lancaster University, I did it whilst I was living in London. All right. I, tutorials were, you know, at King's Cross Railway Station when my tutor would come down. So I went up a few times, but I, I, I'm sorry to say oh. that, I, that I, I don't know much about the Northwest. The Northeast uh, is sort of written to my heart. The, yeah. the North Newcastle is, I mean, I'm a, you know, I'm the sort of person that um, people up north complain about because I, I get, I sort of do get the heebie-jeebies if I go outside the M25. And I think, I mean, I think Hendon is north. So, you know, I'm, I am central casting southern bigger, in, you know, in the way that northern people, in, in northern people would describe. Nonetheless, I have had uh, some of the happiest times of my life um, a long way from here. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good to hear. I just right. want to um, just want to move on a bit. So, um, just so people who are watching this, they might not be aware, but when you're first ordained, you have to serve a curacy uh, uh, somewhere. How was that? Was that a good experience for you? Was it a complete unmitigated disaster, or was it what was it? Was it great time? It was. You know, it was a great experience. So, I had um, I had a trainee incumbent, the boss, the guy, you know. I, you're, you're a sort of Padawan learner in Star Wars terms. And I had, I, my boss, uh, my boss was the nearest thing to a saint I've ever met. And actually that wasn't, that wasn't the easiest, not the easiest sort of people to work for actually. Um, I, I did two curacies. My first curacy, cu uh, training incumbent was a, was a very sort of saintly man. The second one wasn't a saintly man. It was a very good man, a very nice man. I liked him, but he wasn't what you call a saint. And it was much easier to work with. <laughs> But compared to the wonderful Peter Hammersley, who passed away a few months ago, um, who I love very dearly, everything I did was, everything I felt I did was never quite good enough, never going to be, um, I was never going to be as a good a person as him. Uh, and so even though I learned an enormous amount, I also learned that work, saints are very difficult people. Um, and, you know, so I have a, I'm, I'm not a good person. Um, in the way that, uh, you know, that, that you do find them in the church and outside, of course. Um, and I try and work out my own salvation in fear and trembling of being a bit of a, well, not saint. So. Yeah. yeah. I have to say, Giles, you, you know, um, not, uh, not, not um, being able to uh, frequent places such as Oxford and Cambridge. Um, I suppose some people might watch this think when I tell them that you, you, you worked at Oxford University. People might go, did he? Because you seem quite regular and normal. <laughs> how, was that, how was that experience working there, Giles? Well, I sort of loved it really. Um, I mean, it's like, a, it's like so being a, a, a chaplain of Oxford College is a bit like being a sort of, I imagine it's a bit like being a priest, parish priest of a small village in the middle of nowhere which is, you know everybody, you're, the chap, you're, you're pastorally associated with everybody. It's a very small community. So, you, you know, you're not really a part of, there's no such thing as Oxford University. There's lots and lots of colleges. And it was one of these little quad colleges with a quad, everybody there. And it's the people that make it wonderful. You eat together, you know, you pray. Well, you mean they all pray together, they don't come, but sometimes they do. Um, the chat in the middle, like the, the, the churches in the middle of the village. It, 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 was a, it was a sort of style of ministry that a lot of people would recognise. Um, and it wasn't, you know, most of the problems that you deal with, most of the issues are the same sort of things that you deal with in any parish. They really, really are. Life, death, uh, relationships, uh, what am I here for? What am I about? Why aren't I good enough? You know, all of those sorts of things. Um, and... Uh, I mean, mine was a bit of a lefty college, um, but it still was, it was still clever, obviously, and posh, that's, that, that's the sort of dominant theme in most Oxford colleges, but people still had the same issues, same, mm. same issues. So um, it wasn't as rarefied as you think. 
No. Though I did, though I did enjoy going to high table. You do posh dinners uh, often, and I got very fat and uh, developed a uh, a taste for expensive wine. Okay. Um, did come away with that. <laughs> you still got that, have you? <laughs> I really do. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, terrible. Okay. Now, now there you are in in London, and. Um, uh, I was actually born in London, but I came down to London just with the kids this year, and I've not been there for a long time. And it just strikes me, what a, obviously prior to COVID, what such a busy place it is. And, and I wondered how that affects you, you know, what the challenges are for you. I mean, obviously, like you say, you've got the the births, uh, the deaths, and uh, and the marriages. But what, you know, what are the key kind of concerns for you in your parish, Giles? Well, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm sitting in my church, as you can see, I'm also sitting right on top of the Northern Line. So the Northern Line rumbles underneath my church. And the Elephant and Castle, this is a place where tens of thousands of people come through every day, in and out, in and out, in and out. Not only that, but it's a place with high degree of social churn. Um, people, this is a place where migrants have traditionally come in the first places they come if they move to London um, and then when people sort of slightly do a bit better for themselves they they can move out so we get a lot of we get a lot of movement uh, we have posh new flats here that no one lives in because they're bought off plan by the Chinese or by people the other side of the world mm -hmm. they're sort of piggy banks in the sky it's impossible Would you, how, how can you be a vicar to a gated community where the lights are never on mm -hmm. you know, those are those are those are really difficult challenges. Yeah. Um, uh, it's difficult when people come and go so much. Yeah. Um, but in the midst of all of this, you, I mean, in a way, the, the job is to be a sort of strong, prayerful centre as everything changes, you know. Change and decay and all around I see, O oh, thou who changest not abide with me. There's a bit of that in a, in a place where everything's so fast moving. Yeah, we... Uh... We started a food bank. Uh, I've not been the vicar there too long. We started a food bank and I've been uh, amazed by some of the spiritual conversations that we've had with people who've been using our food bank. Do you, do you get do you get people on the edge just popping into your church, just talk and chat? And... Yes, we do. Um, that happens, that happens quite a lot. Um, we, we, we haven't, for a few years, but we 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 um, open up to be a homeless shelter in uh, in the winter months. Mm. Uh, in fact, we stopped doing it because people were complaining this church was too cold. So, so I knew it was time to fix our heating system, which we've just done. Um, and we we too did uh, did some uh, food bank stuff uh, during the lockdown. Um, and and I mean the people who need it. I mean it's it's the, the need is real raw impossible to meet at all um it's very very challenging but the challenging bit is actually to know that you that whatever you can do you can only just scratch the surface and there'll be people who will come and there's not enough and there's that that's the most difficult thing you know, you know, I've, know been, I've been scratching around in my head because we've been doing it for seven or eight months and the need doesn't diminish and in my head i just see this just going on indefinitely and I, I keep asking myself, and now I'm asking other clergy, is there an answer? Uh, I haven't found one yet. And, and I don't just want to point the finger at Boris or anybody, but do, do you think we can, is it a, it's a problem we can solve together uh, in cohesion or not? No. Uh, and I mean, it seems to me that church is one of the places that you come to park, to place, to hold all the stuff that you don't know how to fix. Um, and uh, this is one of them. Uh, so it's a place where it's okay to say, I don't know how to solve it. It's a, it's okay. it's a place to say uh, we failed. It's a, it's a place where all that brokenness is perfectly appropriate. It's like there's very few places in the world where you can come with your failure as much as you can come with your successes. And this is a place where it's absolutely right and proper to come with the stuff that you just don't know how to do. And one of the things that I don't know how to do, I don't know how to fix, is 
some of the great sort of social problems that we have around us. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've had a number of cases of people who um, th they've asked from us things that we probably can't, we can't in the end meet their needs. And that's really hard when you realize that um, Charles, can you give, a, give an example of that, so, you know, without obviously going into too much? <coughs> well, if, you know, we've, 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 we've had some people who are refugees who've come here, people who've escaped some really tragic, tragic situations, run away from really horrible situations back home. They've come here with nothing. And um, that it, it's... It's it's sort of impossible for a small community to, um, to 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 you know pay their pay their mortgage to 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 do all the things that especially in a you know an expensive part of town. Um, so it's a very strange business. I mean, it, you know, this isn't an expensive place, but the property and house prices are ridiculous. Mm. So what, what do you do when you can't do it? You know, you, you just can't do it. And uh, I mean, that, that's that's part of what you bring your inability to fix things here to God. Um, and you, 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 we're not we're not the people that fix it. No, you know? maybe so, because I'm naive to it, Charles, that it's weighing quite heavy on me at the minute. Maybe I need to just accept that a little bit, maybe to know. Yeah, well, it, it, it's and, and it's a sort of uh, I, I think with clergy, it's terribly easy to be the the people who you you end up sort of you end up feeling that you you need to be providing answers to everything. You know, people come to you looking for answers, and you're the one. And I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. And uh, I'll sit with you. I'll cry with you. I'll hold your hand in the middle of it. I'll pray with you. I'll sit before you know in this church. And we will talk about all the things that we don't know how to fix, mm. but uh, I don't. I don't have all the answers for this stuff. And I think, I also think that it's not necessarily the job's the job of the church to fix it all. And it is rather important that people can bring unfixable stuff and talk about it into this space. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I. You know, we live in a we live in a place where people semaphore their successes to each other all the time. But what about a place where you can come and you can sort of like your failures are yeah. um, acceptable? People are not afraid from them. They don't run away from them. And trying to fix them when you can't, or pretending you can fix them when you can't, can be a way of running away from the pain of loss and death and failure. Yeah. Thanks, Charles. That's great. That's, uh, I, I'm going to watch this back. Is that good? <laughs> I just, um, I just want to just bring up something. Just going back to that point as a young guy when you were an atheist, I interviewed Gordon Burns uh, last week, who uh, presented the Krypton Factor. You might remember him for years, and he he he, he hosted the Northwest TV round here, and uh, he, you know, he's very. Uh, lovely, really lovely guy to interview, but said, you know, I'm an atheist uh, because based on 40 years, uh, I've never seen any evidence to suggest um, there's a God. And um, I quite meekly suggested, well, I'd, I've been fortunate to go to the Holy Land this year and said, well, there's plenty of evidence in the Holy Land if you fancy going out there and taking a look. And um, what would what would you say? What, what evidence would you kind of... Uh, I think the weasel word there is evidence, actually, um, because that that slips the conversation into a way that I, I, I feel already I can't explain what it is that 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 draws me to it, and it's not evidence based. That's not what draws me to it. It is it's it's uh, it is like falling in love. Uh, it is having a uh, sort of seeing something. Um, having something sort of described to you that's so exciting and full of joy and full of hope um, that you can't not believe it. So for me, it's, it's the pull of the vision. Um, so if it's sort of evidence, 
you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether people, I, I don't know whether people, I don't know whether people really come to faith through sort of evidence or argument. Um, like, I don't think people fall in love because of, you know, evidence or argument. I think you're captured by something, you know, you, it, you fall for something. Now, you can't make people fall for them, but the funniest things can make people fall in love um, with religion or with another person. And it can happen at the most surprising points in their life. And it can be, you know, in, in, in faith times, it can be music. I think music's very important to me. I'm, I think the best theologians in the church are probably its musicians. Um, they, they, they have an ability to describe uh, describe God. It's not really evidence, is it? I mean, uh, is Bach evidence for the, uh, the existence of God? No, it's not an argument, but my word, it's, yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it works for me. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and music is, you know, uh, some of the hymns just, uh, you know, and, and somebody who wasn't a church person all my life, you know, um, the hymns when I was a boy, have new meaning now I'm a 50 year old bloke and uh, and a profound influence you know they they speak volumes don't they they really do you can I mean you can feel yourself so engrossed in something you can feel like emotionally you know you can feel you want to cry sometimes the way that something will speak so directly into into the situation that you find yourself so um, and I wouldn't call it evidence it's, no. it's sort of better than evidence yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, just moving on because I've got lots of questions, Giles, and, and we don't have loads of time. Um, Quentin Letts, I interviewed Quentin Letts a few weeks ago, and that was uh, that was a really nice interview. And uh, but he was rather cross with the church. In fact, he was furious with uh, Justin Well Well Wellby and his and the church's approach to COVID and the way we were, we closed. And he suggested that if anybody should be comfortable with death, it should be us. And he was yearning a candle and the smell and the environment that was denied him for many months. And uh, I was wondering what your take on that was. Do you, do you think it was the right thing to do? Um, I know Quentin Letts a bit and I like him and I think he's often right, actually. And I think he's probably right on this. Um, uh, I think we were too... Um, I mean, I thought the stuff about, you know, I, I, I live my front door is three steps from the back door of the church. The idea that I wasn't allowed to come in here to pray, I was allowed to come in here to check if it was all right for insurance purposes, yeah. but I wasn't allowed to come in here to pray. I think that was preposterous. I mean, preposterous. Uh, and the argument that, oh, it's privileged for you, but you know, your people couldn't do it. My people wanted me to be in here to pray, to be, uh, to, to be that sort of, praying center in the midst of the community so i think that the church got that very badly wrong i mean very badly wrong uh and so um uh and it just ended up being you know it sounded like a sort of health and safety executive um and i mean i i i suspect that one of the reasons it is it did this is actually something about this terrible report that's come out in the last last week about uh, child abuse in the church. I think the church has been, it was obviously knew this was coming. I think the church has become so, because of that, one of the reactions has become so focused uh, on issues of safety that it, it doesn't have a sense of perspective now about what, about how that sort of quite right and proper concern for safety gets gets sort of properly implemented and I think it just like was a knee-jerk reaction uh, and I think it was wrong and I was furious with the Archbishop of Canterbury too. And so if we all go down into lockdown again do you, do you think the approach might be different or do you think they'll be different this time because there, there was there was there's been a sort of like I, th I think they also recognize that they got it wrong actually I think the I, I, I suspect that the Archbishop was quite stung by some of the criticism um, I think he was quite stung by some of the criticism about creeping centralization in the church. There's been some of that about, 
Uh, he did an article in the Daily Telegraph last month, which it was a sort of a bit of a mea culpa, um, uh, and um, saying, yeah, it's really important that we that we keep authority in parishes, and parishes are the sort of like the places where the church does what it does best, which I think that's absolutely true. Um, so, you know, I, I, the, the, there's no replacement. Zoom will never be a replacement for, for, um, for going to church and receiving um, communion. Never be a replacement for that in my book. Um, you know, it's a great encouragement, Giles, because I think if I'm being honest, I think I've been a bit of a nodding dog and I've gone, yes, yes. And then it's only really since we've been back in church that I've actually realised how important it is still to so many people and you don't quite realize it until it's been taken away from no. you do you? and i don't think other people did as well and um for me i mean this is quite a this is we're quite high church we're quite you know we're quite centered on the eucharist i'd say people come to mass rather than come to church if yeah, you we're know the same. we're the same uh, and um uh but you know being denied the ability to give people bread and wine um, that's what I do that's what I that's all I have to offer really that's what I have to offer as a priest yeah to be denied the ability to give people that uh, I I no I mean you know of course there's right and proper safety concerns I don't think we'll go back to how we were before no. I will, I mean, we'll never go back to the ridiculousness of a church a priest not being able to take services on his own in his own church that, that's just yeah. Crack. Well, well let's Crack. hope let's hope not and just yeah. sticking on that theme of, of criticism Giles the that independent inquiry into child sexual abuse abuse pretty damning as well was no real surprise from that perspective but where does it end when when can we start healing and you know start seeing about the, the many wonderful things we do as church what, what's your take on that I don't know man I just don't know I, I wish I knew I've got to go do, I'm doing Moral Maze tomorrow night. Um, and uh, they've decided, <laughs> producer phoned me up and said, yeah, we want to do, has the church lost its moral authority because of what's happened? And it's in my heart, just like sinks. Um, and because we have, I mean, we've lost, we have lost moral authority, people. And it's, it's so bloody shameful. Um, uh, and you know, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of you know reasons why you know the church was too much of a boys' club, and um, it was all too chummy, and everybody thought, oh, that you know, so and so couldn't really have done that, and he's a bit of he's a decent sort of guy, you know. There was too much of that going on. Um, that I think's gone. I mean, I and I didn't recognise in the report when they said you know the culture of deference, I. Uh, that def cultural deference, as far as I can see, is pretty much gone. I mean, if I, if I wear my, do I don't wear a dog collar very much, but if I wear a clerical collar and I go down the street, you know, it's, I mean, I've been, you know, people wind down the window and shout pedo. You know, it, it's not, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's not a culture of deference anymore no. about. Um, uh, it's, it's awful, isn't it? I mean, I, I've, I've, I've laid him ne next to my wife before going to bed and said, you know, the thought that somebody might see me in a dog collar and think what you just said, pedo, it, it, sent, it really... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it disheartens me, it really does. But, um, and then somebody, somebody, a friend of mine, very politely challenged me why I'm doing this. Uh, what was the objective? And says, there is no objective, really. It's just that when you see these reports, we've had, you know, the public see people in dog collars as just that, you know, those dangerous people. And I find... Maybe this is just a way to try to heal some of those wounds, but it it is pretty grim. It really is, and and uh, people got literally got away with, with murder. Well, not quite murder, but yeah. Well, they, they did. I, I was I I, I sort of I, I sort of felt something of this culture uh, when I was I went to boarding school at seven. Uh, uh, so I went you know, away to school at seven, and I went to a really brutal boarding school, and I got beaten really badly all the time for quite a number of years i'm sure it's sort of like part of my formation it's like mm -hmm. it can be put down to that and and so the sort of abuse of the young is something that i have a 
it, it, it triggers something in me which I, I don't really have. Uh, I, I can't be very rational about it. I can't, I, can't, I can't sort of sit here and be sensitive about it. So I want to both cry and get angry. So I don't know how I'm going to do Moral Maze tomorrow night because I think I'm supposed to be defending the church and I don't know if I want to do that, really. Well, well I, I don't know you very well, Giles, but I'm guessing you probably won't. Well, I want to. I mean, in a way, I want to, you know, because I want to say it isn't all like that. And it, you know, obviously it's not all like that, but I mean, the church does such wonderful things and it's so important for people. And I also think it's a sort of like... It's such a profoundly important organisation. And I love the Church of England. I love the Church of England so much that I'm prepared to give it a bit of stick. Yeah. You know, that's, yeah. that's, it's a sort of different... Is, uh, somebody, uh, somebody woke up saying, why do I keep, wasn't uh, somebody I know put on Twitter, why do I keep waking up at two o'clock thinking I can, in the morning thinking I can solve the Church of England? It's not going to happen, is it? It's a bit like the food bank scenario, isn't it, really? No, no. No, I don't know. Um, I just want to move on. Um, let's let's see if you can offer some positive. Uh, All right. On. Positive. So, you know, um, has the Church of England got a future, Giles? Uh, yeah, it's definitely got a future because people will constantly be discovering a hunger in themselves for something more than just the mundane, the everyday, the, there's always a thirst for the transcendent. Now, if we, can, if we can keep on describing that, then that's fine, that's good, that's what we can do. If we end up, I'm really hard on the sort of bureaucratization, increasing bureaucratization of the church. I think it's a really dangerous and damaging thing that's happening. Uh, uh, if we end up being just form fillers rather than people who just point to something beyond ourselves those two things are in tension with each other and i think if we can if we can keep on doing that people will always be taken up into look i don't care about the church of england i just care about i care about the christian gospel and uh the, the church of england has been an effective delivery mechanism for the church for the christian gospel um for many years and uh, i think it works i think the parish system works i think the way in which we're sort of rooted in people's lives i think that's terrific i happen to agree with the sort of basic idea w with the church of england uh, bishops uh reason tradition scripture you know all of that sort of stuff eucharistically focused i feel comfortable in the church of england but i'm not going to live or die for the church of england but i would live or die for the christian gospel yeah that's a great way to sum that up actually i think a lot of people would sign up to that sentiment um mm. giles you you've uh, you're in london it, do you see your your long term future where you are? I don't know now. Your resignation to your congregation, but you you happy where you are? You don't see anything on the horizon changing, or no? I'm I'm a parish priest. I uh, I tried to be a I tried to be a go to cathedrals for a little bit, and that <laughs> that didn't work too well. Work out quite so well. So I was at St Paul's for three four years, uh, and then all that sort of like um, it all ended in a funny old game and so I came back funny enough I was sort of parachuted into this parish um, and I didn't know where I was going the Bishop of Southwark uh, after I resigned from St Paul said come on sort of picked me up almost by the scruff of the neck and threw me in the parish there were just hardly any interviews it was just I was just like you're going here and you're having him as your priest and we all looked at each other it was like it was like an arranged marriage really and to start with, we were all a bit grumpy with each other, and now we love each other. So it's rather, it's rather that's nice. nice. That's a happy ending, then, isn't it? I'm not sure what happened with me. I was described by my bishop as fundamentally unemployable. I took it as a great. Well, what? Where are you? Where are you? Where's your parish? Um, uh, Burnley. So we're in Blackburn Diocese. All oh, right, 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 right. I've got three bishops. So I'll leave you to work, work it out which one said that to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great compliment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the great thing about the Church of England. Is like it deals with those people like you and I that, uh, you know, I don't know what else. I, I don't, have you have you filled in one of those things about COVID? What else you'd do if you weren't if you weren't doing what you're doing now? <laughs> well, 
I, I, I worked for Argos for 20 years, so I'm just going back there in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> They'll see me through to retirement, you know. So, so we've nearly done, Giles. It's been really lovely chatting, but just a bit about yourself, Kim. When you when you're not got your head worrying about your parish and your congregation, how do you how do you wind down, mate? What do you like to get up to? Well, my uh, uh, funny enough, I was just saying this to the missus just before it came out. Actually, I was saying uh, I like a uh, library full of books, cellar full of wine, and my kids running around all over the place. And that's my that's my sort of like that's what I love. Um, I love I love other things too. I like to see Chelsea win, um, but uh, I just say that to wind up your your northern lot. Uh, well, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm a Burnley supporter, Giles. There's not a lot I can say really. You're going. <laughs> You're struggling to find a point anywhere at the minute. But. I love my kids running around. I love a very nice great glass of Bordeaux and I like a good book. And uh, that's 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 what I really like. And I just sit in front of the fire and read my books and drink my wine and cuddle my kids. And I'd be happy if I never left these four walls, you know. Uh, if I, <laughs> All you I... need is a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> it Not does sound like domestic contentment, doesn't it? So, <laughs> well, it Little, have you got a cat that sits on your knee or not? <laughs> no, fantastic dog. We've got the most grumpy dog. And we've got a dog who's a rescue dog. Rescue dog from Kabul. She used to be a pack dog. <laughs> a pack dog in Kabul. And a friend of mine who's um, covered the, uh, the war in Afghanistan for The Guardian brought the dog back, in fact, too. And she said, I haven't got enough room for her. Would you have her? And she came here and within... Within a, two days, she'd killed all the foxes in the garden and around here. I mean, she's rock hard. And we have, uh, we have the reputation of having the fierce dog in the area, which is not bad, which is not a bad reputation. Not any break-ins lately, then. <laughs> no, 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 no one would dare break in, which is great. <laughs> but she's great with the kids, so what a pan fantastic combination. Yeah, great. Giles, it's been really lovely chatting to you, and I don't want to delay you from getting back to your, your wonderful... Uh, uh, wine and your wonderful family and your books and yeah. uh, just uh, from Burnley in Lancashire we send our love and prayers down to you and uh, uh, this will be on social media in the next few days and uh, just uh, thanks thanks so much for your time and, and God bless brother Thank you dear boy and my prayers go out to you lot in Burnley, very nice to chat to you God bless, see ya God bless, bye